if you think I'm arrogant, and some of you do, then you obviously never met Fred Hoyle. Sir Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle was an atheist and a genius, and I'm going to have a go at him in this video. And he's one of my heroes. He really is, even though he said some pretty misleading stuff, he was a genius. He's responsible for figuring out how stars make elements via the process of stellar nucleosynthesis. We knew stars had a lot of carbon in them, but every time we tried to work out, this is in the late 1940s, every time we tried to work out how this happened, we had difficulties because the theories couldn't make anything like as much carbon as actually exists. So we knew there was something wrong, we were missing something. People were trying to work out how two particles could come together at the energies involved in a sun and stick. They seem to bounce off the, the particles, the, the atoms that the protons and neutrons made seem to fall apart as soon as they were made. And Hoyle came up with the idea of saying, well, it's not two particles coming together. It's a three or four stage reaction involving alpha particles. Alpha particles are basically the, the exposed cores of, well, nuclei of helium atoms, proton and a neutron. They were called alpha particles because when they were discovered they behaved like particles. They didn't realize that it was actually a proton and a neutron. Well, sorry, two protons and two neutrons stuck together in formation. And he realized that for carbon to exist in the abundance that it does, that there must be a, a stickiness, the correct term is resonance, a stickiness which just held the particles, two or three of them together long enough for a fourth one to snap into place and hold the thing in um, a strong, stable formation, if you like. And he worked all this out. He didn't get a Nobel Prize for it. His name is on the paper which became famous. The paper is called the B2FH paper. You can look it up. Brilliant paper, very famous in physics. But he didn't get a Nobel Prize, and some people say this is because he was such a difficult bastard. Uh, and to me, that's not enough reason to disqualify someone from having a Nobel Prize for their work. The work certainly warranted it. it w the Nobel Prize went instead to the people who polished off the germ of the idea which Hoyle came up with, and that's not fair. But because of this, perhaps because of this, he became a very difficult, even more difficult figure in science. And he objected to the, the two principal ideas which rage all across YouTube, which is a biogenesis, the beginning of life, and the Big Bang Theory. Hoyle incidentally came up with the expression, the Big Bang, because he hated the idea, he wanted it to make to seem stupid. His objections to the Big Bang Theory were, were twofold. One, it it seemed too religious to him. As I say, he was an atheist and he thought it was too religious, while as we all know, the religious don't think it's religious enough. How's that for silliness? Uh, his other objection to the Big Bang Theory was that it opposed his theory, which was the steady state theory. The steady state theory says that as a galaxy uses up its fuel, other galaxies are formed, essentially. I simplify everything because that's the only way I understand things. And that was his objection. And he, his, from the evidence available to him, his primary piece of evidence to oppose the Big Bang that he always spoke about was these energy sources that appeared to be coming from between galaxies. When they looked at radio waves, I think it was radio waves, they found bright points between galaxies where when you looked with an optical telescope, you couldn't see anything at all. And Hubble, sorry, Hoyle said that this was galaxies being created out of nothing, even though he could never come up with a mechanism by which this was achieved. Now, recently I've been going through some of my old books and I've had this pretty much all my life. Oops. And towards the back of this, when Hoyle's trying to 
poo-poo the Big Bang Theory, he, he, the only real evidence he's got to poo-poo it is these energy sources. We know these energy sources are now quasars. That is, energy sources from so far away that in Hoyle's day you couldn't see them with an optical telescope. They were way, way off. They were on the other side of the universe, giving off energy which was completely unimaginable in Hoyle's day. So his main objection to the Big Bang Theory is gone. He was never able to explain the things that the Big Bang Theory could explain and he took his objections to the grave. So on the subject of the Big Bang, Hoyle appears to be completely off base. Now the other thing that Hoyle is kind of famous for is his objection to biogenesis or a biogenesis, the beginning of life, the formation of the first DNA molecules, stuff like that. And he came up with the analogy that the probability of this happening is rather like a hurricane blowing through a scrapyard and creating a Boeing 747. Now that, Mr. Hoyle, is a shitty analogy. It's not quite shitty enough to be obvious to a complete novice in science and physics, but to anyone else who's given it some thought, it is beneath you, sir. I question how much integrity you have to have come up with that, because that isn't the case. For one thing, who's ever been to a scrapyard which had all the pieces of a Boeing 747 in it? I certainly haven't. But the true analogy is to imagine a scrapyard, a junkyard, the size of the planet Earth, completely covered in only the components for a Boeing 747. And a hurricane is a rare event. We don't want to think of a hurricane, we want to think of a gentle breeze, which is the, the force of electromagnetism, all over the planet, constantly working on all the components of this Boeing 47 that we're trying to make. So hurricane out, junkyard out. The actual situation is that these components are feather light, they move easily within the breeze of electromagnetism. And instead of thinking, I mean when we think of the construction of a Boeing 747 we think of rivets, screws, bolts, nuts, welded joints, soldered joints. And the idea that a hurricane can do this is plainly stupid. But in, in real life, when we're talking about the components of the 747, which are really atoms and molecules, they screw themselves in. The nuts automatically get tight onto the bolts. Soldering takes place because when the atoms get close enough, they bond themselves, they screw themselves into place. And the other, the other part of the, the analogy that breaks down is once two of the necessary components have stuck together, they stick together. They're not blown apart by the hurricane. They are, the bond is stronger than the hurricane. Well, it's actually, the bond is the hurricane, but let's not get too deep. So it would, it would be like a gentle breeze blowing all these I don't know, many, many hundreds of thousands of components around, but as two components that belong together stick together, they stick. And then another one comes along. It's, it's, it's weird that Hoyle made this mistake, because his solution to stellar nucleosynthesis involved a sequential reaction, as opposed to components, differing components coming together in one go. He realized that it happens in a sequence, two atoms, three atoms, four atoms, hey, we've got carbon. And if you'd applied that very same thinking to this analogy of his, it completely breaks down. The 747 would be made. It took, it seems, 500 million years for it to happen on this planet. So it took some time. And the reason I'm making the video is because today, scientists have announced that the RNA molecule has been found to form and to a certain extent evolve and compete in a laboratory.
one of the great mysteries. Before today, you will have seen lots of videos going, hmm, well, explain the formation of RNA. Well, we just did, asshole. And that's one more gap you've lost. Today is a day when one of the gaps has been filled in. But I'm willing to bet if Fred Hoyle was alive, he'd just poo-poo it, along with the creationists.